Uh, next up, um, and, and Chris and Cheryl will do some more tomorrow on this and some other points, some, some related points. But t next up, Tony Haymert, um, who's the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography um, and works on a number of climate-related issues, vice chancellor of marine sciences here at UCSD as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, it's a great honor to be here with you all, and, and let me add my welcome to La Jolla. Uh, probably we're all here because of uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We're 105 years old, started down on the beach here, and the great Roger Ravel that uh, Naomi mentioned uh, helped Bill bring Johannes Salk um, here, although Roger was very unhappy that Salk got this piece of land. Roger thought this would be the, the heart of the new campus of UCSD, which he spun off in 1961. Um, and from that, all these wonderful institutes and a wonderful collaborative environment has developed. Um, so I think what Roger wanted me to talk about was why am I optimistic or you know, why am I still optimistic? I, 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 you've heard all of the, uh, the, the talks beforehand and, and I hope that's what Roger wanted me to say, so that's what I'm going to say. Um, so it is 50 years exactly since Dave Keeling started measuring um, CO2 at Mauna Loa. Um, it, you know, there's lots of stories around this, but and, and, and you should hear them from Ralph Keeling, uh, Dave's son who's on the faculty here, a distinguished um, chemist in his own right. Um, but one of the most important um, stories is that just before this interaction with President Johnson, the funding agency said to Dave, okay, that's enough. You can stop measuring CO2. We, we understand what's going on. And um, that continues to this very day. One of my earliest jobs as director when I started two years ago was to find a way, even though Dave Killing had passed away, uh, find a way to continue these measurements because we're discovering new things about how the planet works, where the CO2 is going, how much is dissolving in the oceans, how much is going into reforestation. Uh, Ralph Keeling himself studies that by looking at the decrease in oxygen in the atmosphere. We're very careful about the audience that we say that to because some people think, well, are we going to die because there's not enough oxygen? No. Even if we burn every molecule of oil and gas and coal, there'll still be enough oxygen to breathe. It's just that we will have fried the planet. Um, so those, there's an ongoing science excitement about it, but, but yet we had a scientific military industrial complex that said to Dave Keeling, um, it's no longer science, Dave, it's mere monitoring. You know, it's like a tide gauge. It's, it's something to turn over to an operational agency and it's not worthy of your um, scientific investment. So there's, there's a lot to say about this curve and I, I, I kind of think of it as, as an umbrella under which my happiness exists. Um, it's literally an umbrella. It's a canopy that uh, you know, every day when I wake up and, and feel good, you know, I think, oh, you know, what are we going to do about CO2? Um, but I'm, I'm still optimistic because, uh, because of a couple of reasons that, that I'll come to. But so, so just to re-emphasize Naomi's points, um, here we are in 2008. The increase of CO2 is unabated. We're not only increasing, we're increasing at an increasing rate. We're increasing so fast that None of the scenarios that IPCC invented and, and which we've been criticized for, for not talking about reality, but for inventing scenarios, um, none of the scenarios were growing as fast as the reality. No, none of the people who in, agreed on this ensemble of scenarios could understand the boom in China and the, in, the, the, the inexorable rise of our craving for fossil fuels. So sometime in my life, we have to flatten out this curve and um, hopefully see it decrease. But just remember that we're, we're starting from a place where the rate of increase continues to increase. Um, it's important to take away from Naomi's talk that this wasn't some committee that decided this was a problem that we had to solve. This was Seuss and Ravel understanding the work from Arrhenius and others. And, and by the way, I think Arrhenius thought global warming was a good thing. I, I often say that Hobart, Australia, and Stockholm in Sweden you know, probably will benefit from global warming, and, and they may be the, the only two places. Um, 
it was a couple of people understanding that we should look into this problem. It wasn't a committee decision. It wasn't a National Academy report. And, and you know, in 1979, when people understood this, this problem, the, the Charney report that Naomi mentioned, then the community in the United States and their colleagues in Europe set about creating IPCC. You know, one of the troubles I have when I meet people who think IPCC is some great, you know, UN evil organization, um, don't realize that we had to, we as a community had to create this organization in order to make it a global problem and deliberately use the World Meteorological Association as well as the UN to somehow um, make a, a credible body. Um, there's a lot more to say about this, this uh, overarching curve. Maybe we'll move on and, and see one of, um, oh, here we go. One of Dave's other experiments, about 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years ago, Roger decided that he should measure the acidity of the ocean. And he did that off Bermuda, whence I have come yesterday. Um, and then he turned it over to the famous biological station on, on the island of Bermuda. And um, this is a curve that doesn't appear in The Inconvenient Truth or in any of the fictionalized accounts of global warming. But I think it should probably scare you just as much and maybe even more. So we have emitted so many tons of CO2 into the atmosphere that it's dissolved into the ocean and it makes carbonic acid and it makes the ocean more acidic. And the problem is that um, it gets to a point of being so acidic that organisms that make calcium carbonate can no longer make their shell. So that includes all the coral reefs in the world, but also pteropods, little snails that are part of the essential part of the food web of the ocean. So for the last 44 million years, we think the ocean has been around pH 8.2. Uh, in the last 150 years, we've managed to change it by 0.1 of a pH unit. I like to joke about this. You know, here I am explaining to you some you know, terrible foreboding that uh, awaits us, and I'm using, you know, minus the logarithm to the base 10 of a, of a quantity. Um, so instead of saying that the acidity has increased by 30% since 1850, I'm telling you that the log minus the logarithm of base 10 has changed by 0.1. It's an interesting aspect of the communication we heard about in the last talk. Anyway, the, 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 the excitement, the terror that... Um, we've realized recently is that our, our colleague Dick Feeney from, from NOAA in, in Seattle measured the acidity of the water off California last summer and found that during the upwelling season he was able to measure water of pH 7.75. So this is the opposite of the Al Gore. You know, we disappear into the floor to see that amount of pH. So that's, that's what we call um, corrosive seawater. So if you put organisms that have calcium carbonate in them, they actually will dissolve in seawater of that acidity. So this is not something that's waiting for us 300 years in the future. It's something that we're going to have to deal with um, right away. So it's a humbling situation to be in, to be part of a community that wants to deploy an ocean acidity monitoring network right away. And uh, my colleague at um, Scripps, Russ Davis, has successfully built and deployed a network of 3,000 robots that measure temperature and salinity and position, cruise around the ocean. You'll, if you come to dinner tomorrow night, you'll be able to see one of these robots and see where the 3,000 robots are cruising around the ocean. Um, and that took Russ a long time. Probably by the time the international community decided that we should build this network and beam the data back every 10 days to everybody's lab, it took 12 years to build that network, 26 countries. It wasn't done by an operational agency. It was done by individual professors writing three-year research grants to each in their own country um, make a few of the robots from the blueprints that Russ freely distributed to the international community. So we need to create a network not in 12 years but in a couple of years. And how much would it cost? Well, you know, it would cost quite a few million dollars to build such a network. And uh, I was reminded of that last night when uh, I flew back from Boston on JetBlue uh, Airways. And, and after I 
finished writing my notes and replying to email, I watched a little TV set in front of me. And uh, I watched some cable news programs that are, I think, being lived into JetBlue aircraft, if you've had that pleasure. Um, and I learned a lot from that last night. Uh, the first thing was that the, the bailout was passed, $760 billion. Well, here's my little community craving for a few million dollars to make an ocean acidity network that really is going to save the planet, or at least document its destruction. Um, <laughs> and yet, we're fumbling around. We don't seem to be able to do it. Um, just to give you some more scale numbers, the the bills that were passed in Congress, the budget bill, set the NOAA budget, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which I'm a great supporter. It has its flaws, like all of us, but it's a great organization. And it has a budget of $3.9 billion of, of your money. Um, it was, it's been flat for the last four or five years. And yet, operations have been transferred to NOAA. So the satellite program to monitor from space basic variables we need to understand to, to manage America's fisheries, ocean color, uh, measure productivity of the oceans, that, that network is falling out of the sky, we re need to launch some satellites, so next year NOAA will need about $250 million to pick up that load, and that'll have to now come out of other programs, probably out of my research budget. Um, so th those amounts of money investing in our future seem almost tiny, and yet uh, here we are four or five years later, we can't seem to uh, organize ourselves to get NOAA just a little bit more money to, to do these things. Um, so where does my optimism come from? Well, it probably doesn't come from this slide. Um, one of my colleagues, John Gunn, gave me this slide. Um, th these are the kind of animals that used to live in the ocean. Uh, actually, I think John himself has has been snorkeling in waters where these northern bluefin tuna or their relative southern bluefin tuna that John's an expert on uh, cruise. Um, I, I think about this photo a lot. It, it, it emphasizes that the CO2 problem is just one of a number of things that we've done to the planet since the late 50s. And, um, and, and, and it's worth just encapsulating that. You know, when, when Dave started measuring CO2, there were very few people that thought that we could fry the planet with CO2. We, we now understand very clearly how, how to do it. Right around the same time, Rachel Carson was, was doing the work on DDT that led to Silent Spring. And Hal Johnson and other people at Berkeley were beginning that line of work that would lead to the discovery and understanding of the ozone hole by Mario Molina and Shelley Rowland and so on. So, um, and, and in the same context in the 50s was the threat of nuclear war. So, so here, starting in the 50s, we had at least four different ways to destroy the whole planet. And yet I still meet people today who say global warming can't be true. There's no way that you know, we human beings could alter the planet, almost as an act of a statement of faith. Um, so this is another way that we're, we're, we're affecting our planet. And that is, you know, by some accounts, we've removed 90% of the biomass from, from the oceans. Um, and, and it is a, is kind of a scary thought. I, I sometimes give a talk called The War on Fish. And um, since I've been hanging around Roger, I realize I have to have a colon and a subtitle. And, and so the, sub, the colon, the subtitle is Post-Victory Reconstruction. Um, you know, we, we have this military-based technology, which means that um, we can detect acoustically just about every fish that's bigger than about that. And we have the robotic network, you know, invented by Scripps for good, but potentially used for evil, so we can go out and pick up those fish directly. We don't have to cruise around the ocean. In fact, if you log on to some websites in, in India, you can see where the fish are, and the, the local f fishing people hook up their laptop to the battery to get a little power and, and drive right out and, and scoop up the fish. Um, and so this understanding of the fragility of our planet is, is, you know, has dominated my lifetime. And it took a long time to get there. And I, I don't like to beat up on people that I, that I like. But I often read this quote because, you know, this is a scientist that, that meant a lot to me and, and yet was profoundly wrong, as, as I have been many times in science, that all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible, that is to say, nothing we can do seriously affects the number of fish. 
And yet just this year, the number of salmon in California has gone to zero, the, the catch limit for zero. And this great salmon fishery, which we've documented as a people for 150 years, has disappeared under fisheries management as the cod disappeared in, off the coast of Maine and, and Canada. Okay, so that's a long way of coming to my optimism. What's my optimism? Well, like uh, I think probably if Paul Davies is here, I, I came from Australia two years ago back to California, and uh, I lived through 11 years of a conservative government uh, led by a prime minister, John Howard, who didn't believe in global warming. And certainly his friends in the coal industry, uh, if, if he'd momentarily had a revelation about global warming, they were, uh, would soon put him at ease about its uh, reality. Um, yet in that environment, there, were, there was a very positive uh, response. And I, and I know it's a country of 20 million people. It's, it's like Santa Barbara to, to Tijuana uh, spread out over a desert. Um, but nevertheless, that was an extremely unfavorable environment for, for my group of people who were trying to get the government to act on global warming and act on the potential droughts that would come to Australia and sadly um, evolved in Australia during this period. Um, and so the legislation that we worked on, the ideas that we worked on would make their way up through the Department of Environment and get stalled. But then good things happen. So a man called um, Turnbull, Malcolm Turnbull, who's now the leader of the opposition in Australia, the wealthiest man in the Australian Parliament Minister for uh, the Environment at the time, implemented many of those pieces of legislation that dozens of people had worked on. Uh, even though his prime minister was, you know, basically opposed to those things. Malcolm, a very ambitious man um, um, for, of spy catcher fame from some of you who know those stories. I happened to go to high school with him. Um, I, I say that as an apology rather than a, than a boast. Um, you know, good things happen even in unfavorable administrations. And then, as many of you know, um, Kevin Rudd was elected prime minister of Australia last year. The two, first two things he did was sign Kyoto and apologize to the Aborigines of Australia, saying sorry, which is something that his predecessor could never bring himself to say. So what I've learned from my small experience is that things change in, in a hurry. The other thing I've learned is that we have to be ready. So um, I'm not sure that the, the forces of good in Australia were ready for the fact of, of uh, that 11 years of pain and denialism and disconnect between the scientific reality and observing the planet around us as the great Murray River in Australia dried up, um, those days can end very suddenly. And I'm not sure we were ready. You know, I, I remember phone calls after we signed Kyoto. Uh, you know, we were saying to each other, well, what do we do now? Well, the answer was we have to invent a cap-and-trade system and figure out whether there's a Southeast Asian cap-and-trade system or a global cap-and-trade system. And what. But we weren't ready. We didn't, hadn't done enough homework because we were so worried about um, trying to change the prime minister's mind that when we actually succeeded, we weren't ready to do it. And, and I, I wonder whether we're coming to that kind of uh, moment in January. You know, we're, we are going to have a new administration. We might be able to say, gee, no one needs a little extra money to monitor climate change, so we at least know how much time we have to be happy and enjoy our relatives before it all ends. Um, I'm not sure that we are really ready. We've, we, we've, we're working so hard to change the status quo, we, we react so violently against the, um, the anti-scientific mood of, of some in the country that I'm not sure we're ready for the good times that have come maybe with no matter who is elected president. So let me finish with a final anecdote from JetBlue Airlines. I, um, I'm not sure that we are a society that's unexamined, and, um, but the extent of examination is epsilon for the mathematicians in the audience. You often see in football games that the news report of the football game will be a bar where everyone's watching the game. And uh, that's what I saw last night on one of the cable news channels on JetBlue was audiences we are reacting to the vice presidential debate. And uh, so they had a Democratic audience who was, you know, re reacting to a, a comment by Joe Biden, and there was a great cheer, just, just like the football response. And then they had Joe Biden saying, I'm here to tell you that global mourning is man-made. And the news clip was a Republican audience booing. 
we have a long way to go.